So ladies and gentlemen, our speaker is, or our trainer, that's going to present our educational now, is Fernando Azevedo, with the topic, debate, team, and the skill of argument. Debating and the skill of argument, Fernando Azevedo. Good evening, everybody. Thank you once again for the opportunity to present this. I understand and I know that Vital does have an annual debate that they host with Pretoria 2000, or what are they called these days? Vision of Ease something or other. Uh, I have offered to give this, I've offered to give this uh, debate to them a couple of times. They still haven't invited me, but I strongly suggest that they do. If you don't want to take the the tips and tricks on how to debate, how to argue, and how to present evidence, at least to learn how to do it, how to hold a Toastmasters, Toastmasters uh, debating. This is just some of the bibliography that I went through to start to present this again. Pay careful attention to notes. Uh, where is it? To notes four, five. Where is the? Oh, there we go. There we go. To these two here. 1967, the Toastmasters debate annual. 2016 was the last print. Simply called the debate handle. And it is officially out of print, and as I understand it, they will not be bringing it back at all. Toastmasters not only used to have national debate competitions, they used to be international debate competitions, and in Europe, that still continues. There is a debate club in the United Kingdom. In London, the London Debaters Club, they're the ones who have helped me with most of, this, most of the information I'm going to present to you, really awesome people, basically only do that. They only do debating. They hate the inspirational stuff, same as me. I, I, I hear an inspirational speech and my, my eyes roll so far back into my head that I see my own brain. I swear I did. I did the competitions last year, and if I heard one more person talking to me about how to find your center, oh my goodness, I was, going, I was about to run up and slap. Yeah, there's only so many, there's only so many Tony Robbins wannabes that I can handle in one night. Okay. Now here's a few things. Here's a few reasons why I think it's important to learn this skill. For no other reason, this, if you only look at that, for no other reason, it's to understand that your opinion is truly meaningless unless you can justify it. If you can come up here and say, well, I think that everyone should wear pink sandals on Thursdays. Why? Because I feel like it! That's not an argument, right? In the workplace, in Sean's environment particularly, being able to hold your own, present evidence, convince your job, convince your client, convince your manager, convince someone that is trying that, that you need to buy something from them or that they need to buy something from you is a paramount skill to have. Here's the other reason why I really love debate and real argument. If you argue correctly, you debate the problem, you debate the issue, the moment you start playing the person, or in my terms, the moment you start playing the man and not the ball, just remember, then you're not really there for the argument. 
and also, to quote Aristotle, or possibly Socrates, it's not, we're not really sure who said it. When the argument turns to slander, that is the tool of the loser. Because that means they've run out of argument, they've run out of a way to defend their, their position. This is a chap from uh, London Debaters Club. He's currently the debate coach at Edinburgh University. And he said this to me over the phone, and I told him, I, I told him listen, I'm going to steal this from you, but I will, I will keep your name. I absolutely love this, and I'm going to break the cardinal rule of presenting. I'm going to read this because no one get it wrong. A debater who nobody likes can be more persuasive and more effective than a speaker who nobody agrees with. Why do I like that so much? Because I don't give inspirational speeches, I don't give motivational speeches. As a matter of fact, I'm a very provocative speaker, which means most audiences don't like me. I'm not here to be liked. I'm here to get a point across. So let's carry, so enough about that, and let's move on to the Toastmasters debating method. It's based on the UK parliamentary style. Very similar, except that there's that there is no two gentlemen. Okay? And you're supposed to have a little bit more respect for it. There are only two speakers ever. Alright? Why do we do this? It's to try to fit it into an ordinary Toastmasters evening. The other thing is, you need to have a coherent thread with one another. People are busy, we're all professionals, we've all got jobs, trying to get three people to coincide on just one night in a month to try and make a strong, connected argument is incredibly difficult. So you always go with two. And the way that it works is, each speaker gets five minutes. You have an affirmative first and a contradictory. The first speakers, second affirmative, second contradictory. Each one has five minutes. You have 15 seconds as leeway. Then you get clapped off like they do at the Academy Awards. Another. The cross examination, yes. I have this. the concept of affirmative okay. context of this. All right. When you have a topic, that's something that's very important. You always, the topic must always be presented in the positive or in the affirmative way. A great way to explain that is don't use the word not in the theme. So, for example, don't say there should not be censorship. In, because then how do, you, how do I say, yes, I agree in my affirmative and my negative thing? To stop the confusion, to say, rather say, I want everyone to wear pink sandals. Pink sandals should be worn every Thursday evening. That's the affirmative. The negative, the, the negative or the contradictory is, no, we should wear blue sandals on Thursday evenings. Okay? That's the negative or the contradictory. So that's that part there. The cross-examination. I was not used to what happened last year with Vital and Visionary, where we took questions from the floor. That was very weird for me. That's not what typically happens. What typically happens is the second negative, the second contradictory speaker asks a question of the first of the first affirmative. And then there's a small, and then they have a debate question and answer. And then the second affirmative crosses the first negative. So second to first, second to first. Try not to, that session should not go past 10 minutes in total. Three minutes to each is a good, is a good balance to have. Then in the 
than in the rebuttal speeches, in the competitions, in the international competitions, the, the gentleman from Iran that I spoke to, sorry, uh, uh, Jordan. Uh, Jordan has Toastmasters. I found that out doing this research. <laughs> uh, so they said they're very strict that the second speaker is the person who does the rebuttal. The rebuttal is the summation speech. All right? In the UK, they said, I don't care, whoever wants to grab it, grab it. <laughs> Generally, I'm not a good opener. I don't like doing the opening speeches because I'm a little bit more conniving. I like to hear everything that everybody has said. I ask needling questions and then I like to be the guy that's, that summarizes everything. That's what I'm good at because I'm good at thinking on my feet. So pick your strength for those. In the opening, in the opening part, this is a bit of advice that was given to me by Taylor. He likes to coach what is called the ideas method. You introduce your idea. So why do you want to have pink sandals on the first? You define what it means, right? Then, very importantly, you present your evidence. You can't just present it, you have to explain it. Especially if you're arguing something that's quite technical, quite difficult, you have to take the time to make sure the audience understands what you're trying to say, then analyze it and give a summary. When you get to the cross-examination, the easiest thing to attack, to attack is the position, the idea. But you don't really score at many points. What's the smartest thing to attack? I call the explanation or their analysis. It's very, very difficult to attack the evidence. The only way you can attack the evidence is if they present the evidence, if you're arguing a medical thing or even a, a, uh, something to do with labor and they present evidence that, uh, that, that comes from a single source or it's anecdotal. Full permission, tear it apart, rip it to shreds. Show them that they did not do the real preparation. They came to a battle of wits unarmed, all right? But be careful, don't let it backfire. If they present evidence, though, and you feel that they've interpreted it in a very one-sided way, go in there. Go in there and you do not stop. Most importantly, never, ever, ever be goaded into your opponent's argument. When they have something weak, they will always try to segue. How do I know that? I do it all the time. I had, uh, I, well, I did a debate, uh, debate once. I was the coach at uh, Maritzburg, uh, the UKZN. And one of the students, brilliant, brilliant, he insisted on being the second, on being the second speaker. So he and he had two cards. He had two A4 cards that he had laminated, and they were arguing about. They were arguing about voting. So I can't remember exactly what it was. And the first, and the first proposer said something. And they came, and he got up, and he said, "Wow!" And it, it, the, 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 the first, the second proposer, the second. Uh, Proposer said something that was completely off the topic. They started talking about racism and apartheid and whatever. And he went and he pulled out, he pulled out the first card, and the card had the thing said race card. And it was laminated. And he and he literally he went, wow, it got pulled out a little bit earlier than I thought it would. And then put it down. The argument was completely destroyed. Utterly destroyed. Because it wasn't, it had nothing to do with what they were arguing. And because he had it laminated, he immediately said, I know what you're going to argue. I know what you're going to argue because you don't have an argument. So I'm going to take you out. It's powerful, it's nasty, but you let it win. 
When it comes to the refutation of the rebuttal, I am going to go a little bit over time. When it comes to the refutation of the rebuttal, the rule of three is very important. Summarize three times, refute twice. Okay? Make your own point, refute. Make your own point, refute. End on your own point, on your own terms. Be concise and end with authority. You cannot come up here and speak uh, and talk with others. So all the basics of public speaking are still there, but it is far more not aggressive. I'm aggressive. Don't do that. Assertive. And don't lose your temper. Get angry. Maintain control. When it's club versus club, they actually have judges, and I've actually got a proper judge template, judging template that I got from the guys at MIT, who are also really cool and gave a whole bunch of information to me. And they use the, they use a very old, very old judging part that comes from the 90s, but it's very effective. The audience vote is quite nice, but the audience vote you can only do if you're only if you're only at your own meeting or if it's completely independent. And the best way to do that, uh, that's what the guys in, in Jordan explained to me, is as your audience walks in, you give them a little, a little uh, uh, pamphlet, a little paper, they put their name on it, they say which way do you fall on it. Before they hear any arguments, which way do you fall, left, right or centre? And then at the end of the argument, you give everybody their paper back. <coughs> and if they stay the same, the per if, they, if the person came in on the off saying yes and they've said yes, that point goes. If they said yes at the beginning, but after the argument it's moved to maybe, that counts as a win for the other side. Because they argued enough, maybe they didn't argue enough to switch the over, but they argued enough to make them go, ooh. So that still counts as well. Here are other forms of debate. There's a couple here that I want to put in, that I want to uh, add to, to Toastmasters, or at least to our competitions. The full UK parliamentary style, that's a four hour night. Okay, guys, that's, I don't, that'll be one day, I don't think it's most, it's not going to work. The one on one, the one on one is, is nice. It's much shorter, but you can give the, each speaker a bit more time, and they can. And then the rebuttal is instead of 10 minutes, you give 20 minutes. And it's a good back and forth. Panel dynamic thing is more just a discussion. We have that already in pathways, so I'm not interested in that. But this is the one that I really want to bring in, which Sean has, has volunteered for. Presenter versus panel. It's very nasty. It's really nasty. You get an independent uh, panel of three people. Person presents the argument, and then they have to defend it. They have to defend their view. They have to defend what they're trying to say. They have to defend their evidence. The three people in front of that person, no holds barred. They can swear at him. They can. They can swear at him. They can slander him or her. The most important thing, the person presenting must keep their cool. Can they get angry? Yes. Can they get aggressive? Yes. Can they swear back? No. Can they use slander back? No. Can they lose their temper? No. Anyone who's ever done a PhD defence, anyone who's ever done a political defence, anyone who's ever spoken in council or in parliament or anything like that, anyone who's been attacked by clients who refuse to hear your information, anybody who's had to make a sale to a mine captain, okay? <laughs> that, that person knows. That skill, that skill is hard. It's really, really hard. And I'm actually going to be nice to show because <laughs> I won't swear. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Alright. 
Here is some more advice, tips and tricks. If you guys are interested in this presentation, I'm happy to send it to Baptist and to Sean and I'll, and I'll spread it uh, with you. Uh, but it's completely up to you. I just want to close with two things that I absolutely love from Thomas Sun. And it's something that I've noticed is really happening amongst especially the young people. They want to argue from emotion. And one of the things that Thomas Sowell said is that the reason so many people misunderstand so many issues is not that the issues are complex, but that people do not want factual and or analytical explanation. That does not satisfy their emotional need. Or that has not satisfied the emotional connotation that they've made with making that decision. And always remember that emotions neither prove nor disprove facts. And there was a time when we all understood this. But dumbed down education and emphasis on how people feel have left too many people unable to see through this deal. I put massive emphasis on evidence and presenting data, but more than that, it's about listening to the other person. Not listening to reply, listening to understand, and then formulate your Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your time. I really